Chances are you've seen or gotten mad about one of these women in the last year. Almost all of them are just normal people minding their own business on the internet, and almost all of them have become a huge, huge controversy on X, the website we used to call Twitter. Here's why you keep getting baited. All right, let's try a little exercise. I want you to imagine you just saw a random TikTok or a TikTok-like video shared on Twitter or Tumblr or Reddit, but you haven't pressed play yet. Then I want you to think about whether or not you expect that TikTok to be good. As in, I want you to question what your expectations are of the content before you watch it. Now do that again and imagine you're seeing a screenshot of a tweet. And once again, I want you to think about what you expect out of that tweet. I'm going to guess that you expect the tweet to say something concise and funny, and you expect the TikTok to deliver something cringe, out of touch, or even gross. We've been sharing content for so long that now we have these preconceived notions about why we're even sharing that content, both in and across different platforms. And now, because social media is great at destroying context, it has essentially become its own version of context. Basically, people tend to share TikToks because they're bad, and people tend to screenshot tweets because they're funny, or at least they used to before Elon Musk bought the site. And so if you see a young woman cutting up an old dress on TikTok, your knee-jerk reaction is to assume it's for a bad reason. And that's going to shape your opinion on it regardless of what's actually happening. This isn't unique to TikTok either. Think about your pre-reaction before reading a screenshot of, say, a Reddit post, especially one with genders and ages in the title. TikTok content right now has this innately felt level of assumed cringe. And we assume that's the point. I mean, if people wanted us to like their content, they wouldn't have shared it on TikTok, right? And that's why you haven't been able to escape stories this year about people being mad about how women are using TikTok. Early this year, X users became fixated on Depop resellers, arguing it was classist to buy old clothes from thrift shops and sell them at a premium. It isn't. It started in January when a TikToker named JB Wells 2 posted a haul video of clothes she picked up at a thrift store and was reselling. On TikTok, it got thousands of comments and millions of views and lots of nice people saying that the clothes looked great. And then it was shared to Twitter. People weren't looking at it the same way. Commenters said selling the clothes she thrifted made her a mini landlord, quote unquote, who was exploiting people who would have bought the clothes. A few weeks later, a TikTok user named Kelly Hayer began documenting the alteration she was doing to a vintage 70s dress that she bought online. The first video she posted of the dress was watched over a million times and the comments were furious at the idea she was destroying something special and valuable. Hayer explained in a follow-up that she bought the dress off eBay and it wasn't even especially well made. Either way, I think it looked better before she altered it, but no, no, hold on, no. I'm. I'm not going to get sucked into this. I'm not going to get sucked into this. I've seen this same knee-jerk reaction around home remodeling and renovation content as well. The accusation is that they're destroying history, but I'd say 85% of the time, the old stuff is usually both ugly and impractical. This isn't a TikTok but from an Instagram project, but the reaction is exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm sorry, I'm basically a borderline hoarder who loves filling his house with old dumb stuff and even i can tell you that the one on the left looks a lot better than the one on the oh, hold on I, I said i wouldn't do this i'm not i'm not gonna get sucked into this it seems like it's hard for people to see these projects positively once they leave tiktok there's definitely a lot of kids these days thinking going on and attacking people for the sin of hurting feelings but i think it goes beyond that TikTok is so massive, confusing, and opaque to people who aren't on it. So anything from there is automatically not to be trusted, which is exactly what happened in April when hashtag water talk arrived. Water talk is a pocket of TikTok users who make fun water, filling gigantic tumblers with syrups and flavor packets to effectively make custom Kool-Aid mixtures that they have kind of recontextualized as life hacks. When I first came across these videos, my assumption was they were going viral on TikTok because they combine sensory content with over-optimized capitalism. There is simply nothing more powerful on TikTok than someone saying, look at this liquid change color while I talk to you about various products I've purchased. But I wasn't sure, so I asked Twitter. Big mistake, never do this, never ask those people anything. My tweet went way too viral and people started yelling at me. Before my replies turned into digital static though, I did get some interesting responses. 
More than a few people told me they thought this might be a Mormon thing connected to Utah soda shop culture. None of the water talk videos I've seen on Twitter seem to be specifically from Mormons, but I did some digging and yes, Mormons are very big into life hacking their water. Another theory I saw was that this was related to diet or weight loss culture. And the person who posted the hashtag did an interview with Fast Company saying she started it while recovering from a weight loss surgery and that the sugar-free flavorings helped her stay hydrated without feeling nauseous. More darkly, I've seen several people, including a dietitian quoted by The Independent, suggest that this might be a pro-anorexia trend. I'm not about to diagnose a whole bunch of people on the internet I don't know with an eating disorder, but yes, there does seem to be an insidious emphasis on filling up a big old jug of white lady punch and using it to try to feel full all day. It's possible all of these things are flavor packets mixed into the concoction of truth, but there's a larger question about whether or not this is even a real thing. After all this time, I am simply unable to tell if water talk was ever a trend. Or just a weird rabbit hole of niche hobbyists that had their videos stolen and uploaded over to Twitter and turned into rage bait to farm retweets. Look, Twitter has always had a problem with differentiating real world events with the discourse online that they cause. But thanks to the site losing so much of its native culture, thanks to its new owner, it's turned into the unofficial discussion board of TikTok. It's more or less impossible to figure out if something is trending because it's actually happening, as in lots of people are going out and buying flavor packets and syrups to make expensive water, or if it's trending because people on Twitter are going over to TikTok, downloading videos and sharing them. This is not dissimilar from the big hoopla a few months ago about whether or not TikTok teens were standing Osama bin Laden. And it went viral on TikTok with, TikTok with users embracing parts of his message. And not to get too up my own butt here, I do wonder if that distinction even matters to people anymore. On an internet full of evergreen content sorted by algorithmic feeds, everything is happening for the first time all the time again. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. Or sometimes it's not happening at all. In March, I started getting followed around the internet by this video of a woman describing how she would sexually satisfy her hypothetical husband six to seven times a day. The video has been retweeted thousands of times since and got millions and millions of views on TikTok and Twitter. But the video didn't have a watermark that went anywhere and no one in the comments was mentioning who this woman was or what the podcast was. And so I got curious did this podcast actually exist? I tried searching specific lines in the video in the app, which I'm sure has completely broken my TikTok algorithm and put me on some kind of watch list. But all that did was pull up a lot of remixes of the same clip. Then I tried screenshotting it and putting it into Google's reverse image search. But Google image search is totally broken now and all that did was give me a list of Twitter accounts retweeting that clip. I finally stumbled across a TikTok user who shared the clip with the caption, where she at? Someone in the comments linked to an account that wasn't her account, but an account that aggregated her videos, which makes sense because I guess her original account was taken down, which is why it was so hard for me to find it. The reason it was banned is most likely because she's a porn star and she regularly posts pretty graphic content. Her name is Victoria Banks and she has around 1.9 million followers on Instagram, which is where this clip originated from. And she has a few other clips, all framed in a similar style, but there is no actual podcast. It's just these clips. Also, this may come as a surprise, but the clip that the people on Twitter were taking somewhat seriously, or at least at face value in the context of her other videos is absolutely a bit. It's a joke and it's meant to advertise her OnlyFans. But Banks' social media is interesting because it's not just fake podcasts. She also posted clips of her doing man on the street interviews that don't appear to be real. And most of it is going back to either her OnlyFans or other OnlyFans pages that she's working with. To be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with staging a podcast to make viral clips. And there's definitely nothing new about porn's weird meta reality where things are both fake and true at the same time. But there is a darker trend that this is tied to. It's part of a large macro trend across the whole internet that I'm gonna call the dunking on women in podcast content economy. Just like the rage over the dress alterations or the fun water. There is an entire universe of post Andrew Tate sexuality and relationship podcasts that put young women in front of microphones, ask them outrageous questions and turn it into viral clips and let the audiences tear them apart. This podcast called Whatever is one of the most popular ones and it even has a casting process for finding new guests. In Banks' case, though, it's a woman doing it to herself and then using it to promote her OnlyFans, which I think is better, at least from a monetization standpoint, but it still feels icky. And she's not the only one in on this scheme. This is TikTok user Winta Zezu. 
She's refusing to enter her Uber unless there's no one else in the lobby of her building so she can get the perfect aesthetic shot of her entering the car. The video got a ton of outrage shares on Twitter in late March. A second clip of her getting in an argument with a waiter for ruining her food photography did even better a few weeks later, racking up around 20 million views in a few days. Slowly, as Zezu's second clip made its way around Twitter, more and more users began piecing it together that she's doing a bit. One Twitter user even compared her to the Roman poet Juvenal, writing, This has 15,000 likes and people screaming off in the comments because they think it's real, but the account is a modern-day juvenile, and so it's really the comments themselves that make the satire so complete, an absolute work of art. Which is a real weird take, and I'm not sure what Zezu is doing is as clear-cut as that. If you scroll back through the account even six months, it's all pretty normal, relatable content about her being an up-and-coming model and living in New York City. She's funny, but she's still very much just vlogging her life. Last winter, however, Zezu's relationship with her TikTok and her followers seemed to shift. As she started going to higher profile events and getting bigger jobs as a model, her audience seemed to get meaner. She seemed to react to this by courting the hate, creating her stuck-up influencer character. Last December, she posted a whole series of videos where someone interrupts her while shooting a video in public, and it's almost always the same woman that walks across the frame. The commenters think it might be her sister. Since then, almost a third of her TikTok content has become similarly staged videos. I can't speak to whether or not Zezu is part of the same lineage dating all the way back to Juvenal's first century satires, but it's definitely bait, and it's definitely not a new thing. Content creators chasing engagement regardless of what kind to grow their followings happens all the time, and content creators that morph into weird caricatures of themselves much to the chagrin of their audience is actually pretty normal too. I assume that's how my readers feel when I email them for the third time in one week complaining about some random nonsense that Elon Musk is doing. What's interesting here, though, is how quickly this transformation happened on Zezu's account, and how subtle it is for people who aren't following her every post. It also seems pretty clear that putting on a character was at least tangentially related to the amount of abuse she was already getting from her followers. And the uncanny valley of realness that she's stuck in feels inextricably linked to the fake podcast trend, which came out of how popular ragging on TikTok was to begin with. Videos, unlike still image memes, still have the perception that they contain some kind of truthfulness to them. They were shot in a place and time and location, and so we believe that they must reflect that. And worse, the more they're shared, the more we tend to believe them. So when we see a video like the one Zezu makes, something that appears to be shot out in the world without any immediately obvious tells that it's staged being passed around different platforms, we continue to share it as if it were real. And smart creators like Zezu or the porn star with the fake podcast are taking advantage of that as a growth hack, which is understandable from a business perspective, but on a macro level, it's clearly making social media a way more annoying place to be. But it's also just the simple fact that people on the internet don't think women can make jokes and they get really angry when they find out that they can. And that finally brings us to Pinky Doll. A bunch of different tweets with this clip went viral back in July. As one user wrote, anytime I accidentally happen up on a TikTok live, I feel like I'm watching the world end. The user in the clip goes by Pinky Doll Real, and if you're watching this, you've probably seen her already. When I first saw her, I assumed this was a weird fetish thing. It's sort of what I assume most things are on the internet that I don't understand. And maybe this is, but it's also not as random as I thought. She calls the bizarre movement she does on live streams NPC moments, and just like Zezu, she's earning off everyone's reactions to how odd it is. The difference is that thanks to TikTok's payment system, she's earning that money directly from her TikTok audience watching her live. Payments on a live video are based around prolonging anticipation and also rewarding user contributions. I've seen a lot of live streams of people being just one card away from completing a house of cards while sobbing and thanking people who are giving them gifts. Is it super dark and depressing? Sure, but at a certain level of abstraction, all algorithmic video just degrades into meaningless sensory information. But of course, Pinky Doll reached a whole new audience when Twitter users lost their minds over the NPC streamer trend. I think the huge uproar was a confluence of everything I've been talking about. The cross-platform context collapse that made everyone think she looked bad before they even pressed play, and the increasing obsession with anything young women are doing online. And I think the rage bait was even more pronounced here because her videos were optimized to produce the most amount of engagement possible. The sensory quirks that make NPC streams do well on TikTok are affecting Twitter in the same way. An article in The Cut in August fairly concisely and, I have to say, very cynically condensed everything I've been talking about in this video into one headline. After a user named Subway Sessions went viral for her, I mean, to be honest, just like very bad outfit. 
Like I'm like I'm willing to say that it looked up. No, hold on. I'm not I'm not gonna do this. She can wear whatever she wants. It doesn't matter. Anyways, the cut wrote about her going viral, and the headline they used was literally the algorithm chose subway sessions. We asked her our burning questions. In the time it took me to put this video together, which I started like three or four months ago, there was like nine or ten more stories like this that I could have put in. Eventually I had to just stop working on this video because it's constant. I don't know if this is going to continue into 2024, but I suspect it is because the witch hunts and the moral panics around TikTok are only getting worse and only getting higher profile. And almost every single time it boils down to a video of a young woman that's taken off of TikTok outside of her immediate audience and put on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now. And then everyone goes insane over it. And it doesn't have to be like this. We're taking the bait every single time. Sometimes the bait is on purpose. Actually, very often the bait is on purpose and that person is monetizing it. Or worse, they're just a normal person living their life online, trying to do something they're interested in. And we all just pile on top of them and make their life horrible. And it's really annoying. So next time, just ignore it. Just, just close your phone, turn off your computer, go do something else because it's not gonna matter. I guarantee you it's not gonna matter. And most of the times, it's just a scam anyways. Just, just leave it alone. Go live your life. Go outside. Thank you guys for watching. Once again, uh, like and subscribe if you wanna follow for more content. I'm still trying to become more regular about it. I wanna thank uh, my researcher and producer, Adam Boomis, for putting this video together with me over the last couple of weeks and dealing with uh, how uh, complicated it was to put all this together. Um, and check out my newsletter, Garbage Day. Um, I, I, I'm there a lot more regularly. Uh, and I'll see you in the new year. Bye-bye.